All right, greetings. This will be just a, a finalization of PowerPoint for Chapter 2 to make sure that uh, we have completed it prior to Thursday's quiz. Uh, this is being recorded on Tuesday evening, the day we missed class. We had covered this part of the chapter, which was a beginning of a consolidation in actual fact where a purchase has been made, but the purchase is of stock of a subsidiary or investment company and the stock is not being uh, disposed of, it's going to be kept legally so the entity, the entity that's purchased will be continued as a separate legal entity and that's where the consolidation process comes into play. As follows, you have a purchaser or parent company owning a subsidiary or uh, investee company purchased, in this case 100% is bought, and the entities remain legally separate, but from an accounting standpoint, when anyone asks for the financial statement of the parent, the generally accepted accounting principles and international standards say that you give the user the parent company statement showing the results of operation and the balance sheet combined that of the parent and the subsidiary and the best word to call that is consolidation. Using the word combined uh, applies to a different type of similar structure but instead of parent, subsidiary, brother, sister, we'll talk about that in class one day if I don't uh, take care of it in this lecture here, this recorded lecture. Basic idea is the same in either case, combined or consolidated is showing all the entities that are intertwined, interrelated, so that the reader sees the full picture. In the parent subsidiary, as we said in class, the concept is you've got control, so show, you, show us, the reader, what you're controlling. Here's the purchase acquisition. We saw this. Study that. Make sure you know how to calculate goodwill or bargain purchase and what we're doing with these specific assets that are different in value than on the books and records that we're going to amortize or depreciate accordingly depending on the facts and circumstances. We're probably not getting too many problems so far afield of in that nature yet, and that'll be chapter three, but uh, you should know that that's part of the process. Well, we covered for the last time we met on Thursday last week was the opening day balance sheet of the consolidation, and then since this is the opening day balance sheet that we're trying to do now, the date of purchase, no income from the subsidiary is shown. All that income, all those expenses belong to the subsidiary prior to the acquisition date. The acquisition method says that the investment on the books of the company is recorded at the fair value purchased, but in the consolidation where we bring two books and records together, the investment in the subsidiary is going to be shown at zero because everything else is going to be already included, meaning the book value of the assets of the subsidiary plus the additional values that we paid for, the, the book ups, as we call it in the vernacular of the real world, and so that everything is now shown at fair value based on the purchase price combined with the book value of the parent. And so since it's combined with the book value and, this, and the fair value, of the subsidiary, this number is this number of the investment is superfluous. Including it in the consolidation would be doubling up values. These entries are what we call elimination entries. It's probably not the best term, but it's what we use, and they are entries that are not really made on anybody's sets of books. They're phantom entries. They're phantom entries. They're entries that are really made for purposes of presenting a consolidated financial statement. That's probably the best description. Since it's long-winded, elimination entries has become just an easier way to describe that. But these are entries that are made for purposes of pr financial statement presentation only. They're not booked anywhere except on a worksheet like you see here. And these entries are further described in the textbook by the A's and the S's in parentheses. And here's what they are. The first entry, the first consolidation entry, and that's probably the best term of art, come to think of it, call it a consolidation entry, is to uh, get rid of, so to speak, to eliminate, that's where the word 
That's why they call them elimination entries, because we're getting rid of certain accounts that make no sense to put on the consolidation statement. The equity accounts of the subsidiary make no sense to put on the consolidated statement. Look and see why. The statement is that of the parent company. It's going to the parent shareholders. The, this equity section doesn't belong to the parent shareholders. It's only this equity section that belongs to the parent shareholders. So therefore, this doesn't interest the parent shareholders. It's owned by the parent, that's true, but from the parent shareholder standpoint, this is the equity they're concerned about. So all these get, you get, you get rid of them. This is going to become part of what I call my brute force logic to doing the consolidation. Many of these entries, in fact all of them, are logical, reasonable, and can be deduced by just thinking about what you're trying to do. You can learn it by memory, memorizing it, by just following the formula if you want. But I like to think in terms of being able to do it on my own if I didn't have the textbook in front of me. It's just logical that these, and these particular accounts are not part of the consolidation. And look, this is the consolidated total column, and you can see that the common stock is that just belonging to the parent shareholders. That's who this statement's going to. It's the stock of the subsidiary, again, is owned by the parent, but in an investment account. Okay, we're not showing the investment account. That's because we're showing the assets and liabilities at the stated value that's on the books of the subsidiary plus the book up of the fair value at data to acquisition. Let me say that again because it's so important. We are not showing the investment account in the consolidated total that goes to the parent shareholders because we're showing all of the book value, assets, and liabilities of the subsidiary plus the book up based on the date of acquisition method valuation. And that's why that's not shown. And that's why the only equity accounts showing up are the equity accounts of the parent. So that's entry they call S. S for stockholders equity. All right, fair enough. Entry A, maybe because it's the first entry, deals with putting the values for assets, liabilities, intangibles, goodwill on the books of the consolidated financial statement or on the work papers of the consolidated financial statement. And that's what this entry is all about. The plug entry in this case is to the investment account, which at that point should eliminate the rest of the investment account shown on the worksheet. Notice here that the plug entry here is the investment account. So you know to do these debits because you have these equity accounts here for entry S. So you do that, the plug goes to the investment. You know to do these because you're given this information, the A's you're given, how much more the value is compared to the books, being what's paid for, fair market value of this was paid for 200000 more than what's on the books. That's a book up. This is a book up. That's a, a book up, you can call it, but it's creating customer contracts that weren't even on the books of the subsidiary. So you could just say they were on at a net book value of zero, so we're booking it up to the fair value. And then the goodwill that was purchased is also being booked up. Here is a liability which is being uh, booked up as well for, purpose, uh, for reasons we'll talk about in another time. And the result of entry A is you got all these debits and a credit here. The plug goes to the investment account. And look, between S and A, the investment account is zero. So your proof that you've done this right is that your investment account is zero. Your proof that you've done everything else right is that your Equity accounts are only those of the parent, and your final proof will be if you balance. That's always a good final proof. So those are the entries that we've learned about in Chapter 2. We'll have more to come uh, as we move from acquisition date to the next date, which will be first year of operations, and that will be Chapter 3. In the meantime, that really is all of Chapter 2. Uh, let's see some additional issues uh, that this chapter talks about. You may have to record, like we did here, uh, customer contracts, which were not on the books of the subsidiary. How would you know? 
Well, you, most problems will tell you, but the basic way that GAP does it is it looks for is the intan did the intangible right or asset arise from contractual or other legal rights? Is it capable of being sold? So if we're buying it, then that's certainly answering that it's capable of being sold. Both these criteria are required in order to know that we can record a good a intangible other than goodwill. If we don't meet these two tests, the intangible would be recorded as goodwill. And the intangible would be determined by the fact that the fair market value of what's being paid is greater than the net identifiable assets. So sometimes in the concept of identifying the assets and comparing it to the fair value, some assets don't show up on the books of the subsidiary, like here, the customer contracts didn't show up. It was a value that and a, a right, a contractual right, created by the subsidiary, but they couldn't book it as such because they created it. It was an intangible. It has value. We're paying for it. It's a real right, a legal right, as it says here, or a contractual right, and it's capable of being sold. We bought it. Therefore, it gets booked. All right, and uh, here's examples of it. Discussions of intangibles. Notice that pre-existing goodwill on the books of the acquired company is ignored. We, are, we have now an opportunity with the acquisition to revalue the goodwill of the, the company as a whole, even if it was acquired goodwill by the subsidiary. Since we're doing an acquisition date method, which is fair market value and booking up assets, liabilities, we now have an ability to reset the clock on the amount of goodwill held by the investment subsidiary by the fact that this is an arm's length transaction occurring now. So any pre-existing goodwill is ignored, we redo it. This is in process research and development. If it's reached technological feasibility, it's capitalized as an intangible with an indefinite life reviewed for impairment just like we do for goodwill. We don't try to figure out what the life of that is. Ongoing research and developments and expenses incurred, as usually it is for gap and tax purposes. Bingo, that's it. Here's some examples of goodwill, or I'm rather intangible, separately stated from goodwill. You can go through it and uh, see if you recognize anything that you're familiar with, like operas, ballets, etc. So those are intangibles that could be booked in a arm's length transaction per purchase. You can read the part of the chapter about conversions and the rest of the chapter I'm not discussing or testing at this time. We'll talk from time to time about some of the older methods used which are not in use today except if it was done at the time of the purchase they continue to be used uh, to this day. In other words, we didn't reset the clock, but for all new acquisitions that occur today, it's acquisition method only, none of the, no pooling of interest, no purchase method. So you can just read about those, and that is that. So uh, um, I'll next see you in an explanation of some of the problems. Talk to you then.